We have all heard time and time again how your companies and others across the country are adopting a modernized recruitment and hiring process. Today, we are also taking steps as the nation's largest employer to lead by example. The President will shortly be signing an executive order directing federal agencies to start hiring based on skills and competency rather than outdated degree requirements. Both the Board and Council have continued to ensure that no matter the economic circumstances, American workers are put first. Over the course of the past year, we have seen the lowest unemployment rates ever recorded, including for African Americans, Hispanics, individuals with disabilities, and our veterans. And we have seen significant increases in labor force participation, including for those who have long been on the sidelines, coming back into the workforce at record numbers. But within a few short weeks, our country experienced rapid economic and social changes brought about by the global COVID-19 pandemic. We were challenged to rethink how we live our day-to-day -day lives. Despite these new realities, one thing has remained constant. This administration and the members of this advisory board have fought and will continue to fight for American workers and families. Prior to the pandemic, the advisory board laid out a bold agenda focused on how best to prepare American workers for the changing nature of work and the future of automation. Through the advisory board, we have addressed these issues and recommended changes, and now COVID-19 has brought forth a critical urgency to implementation of a set of action laid out in last month's call to action for lawmakers, businesses, and educators alike. The group of leaders here today believes in providing Americans with multiple pathways to education and career success. This includes short-term credentials, associate's degrees, on-the-job training, bachelor's and master's programs, and, as I had mentioned earlier, apprenticeships. We believe in both increasing the availability of high-quality and transparent data to show the private sector return on investment in workforce development and the ability for individuals to make informed choices about their educations and their careers. We believe in modernizing the way in which employers recruit hire and train their employees so they can attract and retain workers with the skills needed to fill specific jobs and ensure that Americans with those skills are no longer overlooked. We firmly believe that all employers must invest in their workers through education and training and that it's not just the right thing to do, but it's good, smart business. As we continue to bring manufacturing jobs back to our nation from the shores of California to the coast of Maine, we must ensure hardworking Americans are prepared to fill those jobs. This National Council and Advisory Board has taken critical strides to increase the agility of our workforce development system, but we have much more to do. That is why I'm pleased today to announce that the President will sign an executive order continuing the National Council for the American Worker and the American Workforce Advisory Board. I want to thank each of you for your service and your commitment to the cause of the American people. There's a lot of hardship right now and a lot of uncertainty, and this work takes on more meaning than ever before. I would now like to turn it over to my co-chair, Secretary Ross, to say a few opening words of remarks. Thank you, Ivanka, and thank you for your visionary leadership of both the American Workforce Policy Advisory Board and the National Council of the American Worker. Thank you also for bringing both groups together here today. Their presence here at the White House is a testament to their dedication to the American workforce. We must also commend the advisory board for calling an extraordinary meeting in mid-May to address the abrupt changes and tremendous challenges facing American workers due to the pandemic. Today, the U.S. economy is emerging from the greatest public health crisis in a century. I've been traveling the country over the past month, visiting companies and talking to executives, workers, trade groups, and community leaders. Everywhere I go, there is optimism about the U.S. economy and its near and longer-term prospects. We thankfully see this reflected in recent economic indicators. You've heard about a lot of them, but the one data point I would highlight is the amount of money Americans are saving 
the amount of dry powder they have. This morning, the Bureau of Economic Analysis of the Commerce Department reported that the personal savings rate was 23.2% in May, up from 8.4% in February prior to the pandemic. And that compares with around 3% in 2009 during the last crisis. So the consumer is in far better shape than ever before. In fact, last month, Americans saved $4.1 trillion, up from $1.4 trillion in February. Federal Reserve also reported last Friday that U.S. bank deposits have increased by $2.1 trillion since the lockdowns, from 13.4 in February to 15.5 as of June 10th. So unlike in 2008-2009, our financial system is sound. And as enterprises reopen, Americans will be pumping money back into local economies and furloughed workers will be hired. Since producing its call to action on investing in American workers to expedite the economic recovery, the advisory board's four working groups have come together multiple times to expand on those initial recommendations. You've outlined the means required to expedite American workers' return to employment and upward mobility by investing in career pathways and implementing skill-based hiring practices. Second, remove obstacles in American education and training to accelerate reskilling and facilitate innovation in workforce development. And you have recommended that we build the technological infrastructure necessary for the future of work. Today, our working group co-chairs will share how they have expanded on that call to action. We will discuss recommendations to expand access to broadband and encourage more employer training investments. We will also discuss how the advisory board's recommendations are spurring action in the federal government and the private sector. Secretary Scalia, OMB Acting Director Voigt, and Bureau of Labor Statistics Commissioner Beach will share their work on implementing the advisory board's recommendations along with requirements in the President's original executive order establishing the Council. We also will receive updates on the private sector-led workforce readiness campaign and on interoperable learning record pilots. Again, your effort to be here demonstrates an abiding support of American workers. On their behalf, I thank you. Ivanka. Thank you, Secretary Ross. And um, following those great opening remarks, I think we'll just dive right in. So Ginny Rometty, if you could give us an update on um, the multiple pathways campaign that you've been working so diligently on with your working group, that would be yes. terrific. So thank you. And, and I think as everyone knows, we've been updating our yeah. call to action in the campaign yeah. for all of the obvious reasons we discussed, because last time, the part that did not change was the focus on pathways mm -hmm. and this idea that we would hire for skills first. But you might remember the campaign was first called New Rules, but that was for a different point in time. And so I'm happy to tell everyone that we're in the final days now that we've been refashioning it and really focusing it to recognize the moment on opportunity and access for everyone. So the new theme is find something new and it is targeted for um, those who are out of work, those who have to reskill, and then as well, those who are just looking for a new pathway, which is really the original point we were on. And so I think it is more relevant than ever. It, it does hit, I think, um, the new reality as you both, both um, uh, Advisor uh, Trump and as well as Secretary Ross described, the new reality for everyone. And 
I hope what you'll see, it's positive, inspiring, hopeful, but yet it's realistic. And that was really the point. So we now feature, not that we didn't feature real people before, these are real people um, with real stories, having moved to real new different jobs and all the different pathways that um, Ivanka just outlined. And what we have, and I must say, Ivanka, you saw this early on, there's just low awareness for all these pathways that are out there. And this is why originally you said stay with the campaign, right, yeah. as we talked about it. So, um, so the new campaign, as I said, find something new. Um, it is going to focus on the kind of jobs where there are job openings. And uh, let me give you an example of what I meant by it highlights real people. We've now interviewed dozens of people, real life stories, a janitor, a retail person who now is working in technology, as an example, retrained. A person who at 17 went into the Army, two tours of duty, now working, it happened to be technology. A fitness instructor, social distancing makes that hard, now doing welding. So we really did find, and I think appeal to all different kinds. And this was a partnership that the Ad Council, I've told you about, has contributed their time to. It's approximately 30 million of media they'll be doing. IBM and Apple led it, along then with contributions from our co-members here. So we're positioned and ready to go with print, television, digital, social, about middle of July. We did then, in this time, say it's not enough to just do a campaign, in which you'll, you can look later, it's in your books. There has to be a call to action about what to do. So um, my colleagues at IBM have uh, beavered away at building this website, which we've now probably rebuilt three times to be of the moment. And what the website does is it links to 180 now resources and growing. It starts with describing 12 rising jobs, careers, jobs you could have. We've added things like contact tracer as an example of the moment. Then there's a section on um, find your pathway. And this is to the point, we are, I think we are now at 80 different programs and paths you can take to get a certification, uh, some kind of credential to one of these jobs. And then after it takes you down that path, it allows you to say what are other resources that you have need to help you. Maybe it's a resume, maybe it's childcare, links to, and there's another 60 resources to go there. And we then tested it with um, over 300 unemployed uh, people. And to be sure, our ratings are 80, 90 percent. And you know, you might or might not be surprised, the number one thing people appreciated is that it's all about real people and about real situations. So, uh, Ivanka, I commend you for having led us. You've been steadfast in this um, in leading the administration's efforts. And so, thank you. you. You did have the idea about staying focused on a campaign, and I think it turned out to be more right than ever in this moment. And uh, so we're ready to go, middle of July, all the media plus website of action and where to how to get ready and get your jobs. And if I could close on just two other quick points. Um, one is that uh, I wanted to make a comment on policy, if I might, because there's been two pieces of progress. Obviously what Ivanka just mentioned is the skills first executive order. I know IBM supports it as does our committee that worked on this. Um, and I, I just want to be sure I think it's a critical step for expanding opportunity for so many Americans. Um, the second thing that, um, and Secretary DeVos is here, that I wanted to commend the Department of Education on is that it was just last week the Workforce Preparation Grant Program, part of CARES Act, which is right in the bullseye of what we're talking about to implement short-term education and training for people. So thank you for doing that in, in right the moment. So we often talked about making policy change in this group and we thought it would be on a longer term horizon. These have obviously come on a nice short-term horizon for the moment. And I'll just close my opening comments with my own reflection um, from IBM in that you've heard me, those of you, maybe you've heard me like too much for a long time, talk about this idea of new collar jobs, not blue, not white, give an opportunity to people without four-year degrees. And my colleagues are going to an update on their progress, but I just thought I would share my own skills first uh, experience prioritizing that over degrees. It was 15% of our hiring in the United States last year were skills first hires, which I think is a, it would not have happened. And of course, they're from the most socioeconomic distressed areas and people. And so that has been our, it's been excellent, the, our experience with it. Our apprenticeship program, which is a formal earn while you learn, grew twice as fast as we thought, and we're up to 500 a year. And then 
as, as you know, a public-private partnership model on education, these six-year high schools, we now are up to 220 schools with a pipeline of almost 200,000 students. So I believe collectively together, I hope find something new just keeps, it's an umbrella for all of us to put these efforts underneath. And so um, it's a good moment to have given an update. We're ready to rock and roll, as they say. So if I can um, just turn over to my colleagues. Uh, to, is that okay to make some? Oh, yeah, we do have some of the new advertising. It's in your book. It's up on the charts. I just, it's not the live stuff yet. You'll see that soon. But it just gives you that feeling, the new corner office, working in energy, solar, you know. And it's meant to be aspirational. And then the place is the call to action to the website, which we've simplified it tremendously. And they all tell us they can use it. So I'm hopeful this really drives a result. Um, it's, it's terrific. And, um, and you and Tim and, and the Apple team and, and your whole team have just been phenomenal in terms of driving this, the creative, um, the content, the testing of its efficacy. So the whole um, advisory council really thanks you. And, and, and I do think one of the things we kept on hearing, and I visited several of your great programs across the country, um, specifically the P-TECH programs, was that there's just, as you note, a lack of awareness around the options that exist and the multiple pathways to career success and to acquiring skills for jobs that are in demand post-pandemic, but there are some industries that are hiring today um, during this current crisis as well. So, so I think having the, the call to action to actually visit the website and explore some of those options is, is great re regardless of age range. And, and you are very sensitive in developing it that it can be for the student, but also for the mid to late career worker. So we are quite excited for this launch. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny. Yes, and can I turn to my colleagues now, oh, right? Because um, IBM, while I have our programs, my other colleagues have been very successful with yeah. theirs. And so if I can start with Marilyn Houston, uh, chairman of Lockheed Martin, to start with her experience. Thank you, Jenny. And Secretary Ross, Ivanka, thank you very much for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we're doing toward the call to action that was outlined for us. And I'll just talk about a few things that we've done in the last few months in three areas. One is on, on what we're doing in, in the hiring and recruiting area, what we're doing to build the STEM pipeline, and then lastly, what we're doing on technical skills and skills uh, growth. Uh, first of all, on the, on the side of uh, recruiting and hiring, we did kick off something, some new approaches that we're doing for veterans and military spouses. In April, we rolled out and launched our um, hiring pathways for veterans, and it's more of an accelerated pathways for veterans, particularly those that were most impacted by uh, the high unemployment associated with the pandemic. And uh, I can tell you that as you talk about companies that are hiring, we are hiring. Since uh, March 19th, we've hired over 8,000 people, and we expect to hire close to 12,000 people this year. So we continue to hire. We're an essential service that, and business that's worked all throughout the pandemic, and we, we have and we're continuing to need uh, additional workers. So this, this, these pathways for veterans is an area that's very important. Uh, the second area that I wanted to touch on is building the STEM pipeline. We're continuing a lot of our programs and initiatives we have in that arena. This is where we're focusing on students that may not have considered a STEM career or a STEM uh, opportunity, and we've got a lot of programs and initiatives just to create that inspiration for them so they'll pursue STEM. And through that, many of them would not have considered it at all, and it would very much change their lives. It's a lot of those who are underrepresented, who uh, gives them a new opportunity. And then the last area that I wanted to touch on is our technical and skills building. And in January, we launched, uh, as part of our pledge to the worker, uh, to the American worker um, commitment that we made, we launched a five-year, $5 million vocational scholarship program. And it's the first of the kind in the aerospace and defense industry. And as of June 16th, we awarded 150 individual scholarships of $6,600 of scholarship money to help cover vocational uh, training costs for individuals so that they could continue uh, their, their opportunities in these critical areas. And these are for people who don't need, they don't need a, you know, a four-year degree or anything like that. They just, you know, this is an opportunity for them to have a scholarship to, to go forward um, through that for training, to cover the training cost. We also recognize that during the pandemic, a lot of the things that we had going um, we're going to move to virtual training, so we funded a lot of additional equipment to allow that, that we didn't lose any time on the apprenticeships and other things that we support 
by providing some additional funding for uh, virtual training. So we're very, we, we very much um, appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this important body and what we're doing for the American worker. And these are just a few of the things that we're doing across that arena at Lockheed Martin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana. And next I'll turn it over to Scott from Western Governors University who's been leading alongside Governor Holcomb the working group on data transparency. So if you wouldn't mind kicking us off, Scott, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Ivanka. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be back with all of you. Um, as you well know, we've been talking for a long time about the interoperable learning record, and I think it's also true that in an era where our digital connectivity is more vibrant and more needed now, um, it is a prerequisite to accessing higher education and also many of the job opportunities that are out there. And so this digital divide that we talked about as part of the call to action, uh, it is highlighted because it limits the development of our workforce and it amplifies inequality. And so thank you, Ivanka, for outlining a path forward uh, to bridge this digital divide. Um, I also want to move to our next agenda item related to learner records. And I want to first recognize the work of this board, as well as uh, the dedication and vision, particularly of Ivanka and Secretary Ross, as well as Chris Liddell and all of your respective staffs. The tireless and insightful work of the U.S. Chamber is also noted. Uh, and those who have spearheaded pilot projects, including Walmart and our friends at IBM, Salesforce, and Workday as well. Um, this group is focused on a policy agenda designed to give every uh, person in this country a pathway to opportunity and has been visionary in its embrace of the underlying technology needed to enable that future. With, with this concept of an open and a transparent and a individually owned record of skills and competencies, this group has taken an idea one that honestly has the potential to change the future of learning and work, and has studied it, collaborated on it, invested in it, and ultimately is now working to make that a reality. Um, as you well know, great ideas also don't come out of the box proven and fully formed. Um, and they don't also come out of the box with a name. We have thus far <laughs> referred to this particular transformative idea as the ILR. Uh, go ahead and try to say that three times fast. Uh, the interoperable learning record. Uh, we recognize that this is a mouthful when we say it. This group and its partners have considered a range of other nomenclatures and based on that pro process, we will now be using the term learning and employment record, which I think is a much more descriptive and more accurate term of it. So the learning and employment record, or LER, we believe that this name is intuitive. It's also pronounceable, digestible, understandable, and it can become part of the American lexicon of education, work, and job searching and hiring. Uh, what is an LER? For those who are, who are new to this conversation or to the work, I'd just let me take a moment, if we could, to reflect on why this technology is so essential uh, to opening the pathways for opportunity for every American. Um, the purpose of the LER is to create transparency for every individual uh, so that they can articulate their skills and capabilities to both current and potential employers regardless of whether they learn those skills on the job or at an institution of higher education or in the military or at an apprenticeship. The record is owned by the individual, meaning that it follows them through their educational experiences and their employment and their entrepreneurial journey. It is a lifelong record. This gives those individuals added resilience in times of turmoil, disruption, and changing circumstances. And for instance, we know that in normal times, 43% of college students transfer during the course of their college careers, 43%. And those students will lose, on average, 40% of their credits. As we transition to LERs, nothing will be lost, and individual skills and competencies belong to them and are universally and transparently recognizable by any institution or employer. So the LER opens the door to a labor market that is denominated by skills, open to every individual and supported by an aligned, dynamic, and relevant education system. If skills are the currency of the future, the LER is the wallet. This technology is how we enable the highly competitive workforce of the future. It's how we unleash and showcase the potential of every American and how we transform the world of education and training and really truly reinvent the talent supply chain. The truth is that innovators have been working on developing and implementing technology for a skills-denominated future since the 1970s. This is not easy work, as you might imagine. There are significant hurdles to overcome to achieve widespread adoption, and the strides that have been taken over the past year by this group 
are nothing but historically unprecedented. So that acceleration of innovation and collaboration have been made possible truly by Ivanka's leadership, by your commitment and dedication to this vision, and I want to take a moment to recognize that. You've truly assembled an incredible team of leaders, of employers, of education institutions, and ultimately you've pushed us toward action. So we now, as a result of your leadership, have LER projects in motion that illustrate the viability of these ideas. So ultimately, every worker in America will be the beneficiary of this effort. Uh, if I can uh, take a moment now to introduce, if you will, some of these pilots, and I'll be brief in that, and also, Ginny, I think some of that will come back to you to let you talk about that. Um, so we're humbled to be part of this work. Um, WGU is, uh, is partnering in many of the pilots, or several of the pilots that are taking place. And the incredible power we and others have witnessed as part of these pilots is the interoperability between the various blockchains being developed. So I will provide an update on WGU's work and involvement in two of these pilots, and then we'll hear from Ginny and IBM who are leading an LER pilot to better match learners with careers in cybersecurity. So we've been a believer in this skills-based future work and everything we do is designed with students in mind. In addition to providing a workforce line competency-based education, we've also made a significant investment in mapping the skills that drive those competencies. That has prepared us to support uh, a partnership with Salesforce on their pilot, who will be opening a skills library to allow Dignity Health with nearly 60,000 employees at 300 care sites in the Western United States to view validated achievement and credentials for their nursing candidates. We're also supporting the Walmart-led pilot to prove out the interoperability of the learning and employment record. And through Workday, we are first pushing verified credential data to Walmart so that Walmart is able for the very first time to have transparency into the skills of its massive workforce. Once that element of our work is complete, we'll reverse the process, meaning that we'll be pushing badges that represent the skills, skills data verified by Walmart over to the WGU system. This is an example of where those skills and competencies developed in work can also translate back into educational pathways. And that pilot demonstrates the potential connectivity ultimately between academic institutions and employers. So it's truly an honor to participate in this work and I want to extend our gratitude to Doug as well as Mark for inviting us to play in roles supporting these background projects. And last but not, li not least, I also want to express our sincere gratitude to Ginny and the team at IBM for inviting us to collaborate with you to prove out how LERs can also support learners in mapping out a pathway to a career. So I'll turn the floor over at this time to either back to Ivanka or to Ginny, wherever you want to go. I think you did a wonderful job. So I would only add, I think I, you just coined, we knew skills of the, is the currency of the future, but I love it that the LER is the wallet. So perfectly said, and I would only add that um, the pilot we're doing is based on blockchain technology. It's a perfect application of blockchain technology for cybersecurity, and it proves the portability between the employer, the individual, and the academic, uh, it, what, multiple academic sites, obviously. and. Uh, I would just say so far so good, and it's also a great one. Maybe we had an EO on skills first. Maybe then it'd be a great one for the federal government to adopt this LER as being the world's largest employer, or country's largest employer, actually. And uh, we'll see how our pilots go. I think that's a great segue yeah. into Russ, who can share with us a little bit about the um, incredibly exciting EO that the president will be signing shortly. And, and, and thank you all for the hard work on this. These pilots will ultimately be rolled up and something that we hope to replicate on a much broader and larger scale once we've proven track record and success. And um, I think everyone around this table shares my excitement for how transformative this could be in terms of creating transparency for people deciding on what education path to take or on an education path about where the jobs exist, um, and then also for employers to recruit that talent seamlessly. So, so really great work, and, and thank you both very much. And, and Governor Holcomb, thank you for your terrific work on this group as well. So before we turn it over to, um, to Russ, do you have anything to add? Well, just I'll, I will be brief, thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Secretary Ross, and to every member of the board for your I mean, this is going to make a big difference, and you've, you've used the word Ivanka transformational, and we're, we're seeing it play out before us right now, and the urgency has never been, the urgency of now 
as Dr. King mentioned decades ago, is, is squarely upon us and the work that we're doing here. I'm just excited and encouraged that we're getting to the action part of the endeavor. And our uh, committee has been, we've met multiple times since that, since the May meeting, um, and if you will, broadened our focus to take in a couple um, areas. One, making sure that we're, in terms of action, making sure that we're laying that groundwork for all the technological advancements that need to occur and uh, in terms of infrastructure, and then continuing uh, our engagement and focus regarding the um, learning records. And I can't tell you, Scott, how pleased I am that we've changed the name. Uh, we, we talked a lot about that, uh, but uh, for, for only us to have understood what it meant uh, would have been a slow start out of the gate. So, uh, but, you know, this pandemic has brought this really into focus about how much we have to get done and who will potentially get left behind. Um, and so um, speed to market is critically, critically important. We, we focused in on five key areas um, just very quickly. We wanted to make sure that we're um, um, advancing um, action items that will apply to all. Um, obviously, again, the pandemic, is, the pandemic has just vividly revealed various disparities. Um, they were there prior. Uh, they're there now. What we don't want to see is that gap widening um, in, the, in the months and years ahead. And so increasing access to educational and, and um, employment opportunities for Americans is rightly number one. That's both in rural and urban. Again, Secretary DeVos, thank you for your partnership as well um, in making sure that in our school corporations we're not flying over urban or rural or suburban, that we're actually connecting to all. Um, secondly, we focused on uh, all the coordination um, that's a must and all the opportunities to empower government sectors, making sure that it's a truly a st local, state, federal, tribal, that cooperation is in place and working, um, not just waiting on one another, but those, it's an orchestra that's, you know, being conducted. Um, that has to do with the regulatory environment, so for the, for our federal partners, uh, making sure that we can do certain things to get to uh, the market, critically uh, important for the states, um, like Kim and I from Iowa and Indiana. Um, we, are, we are bringing all of our resources to bear um, as well. And Indiana, just um, as an example, um, we took a billion dollars and said, we're gonna have a next level connections program that has a lot more to do than just roads. It had to do with trails, it had to do with airports, water ports, it had to do with broadband internet connectivity. And in a state like Indiana, and I'm sure Iowa is about the same, that we're 83% farmer forest terrain. And so expanding that field into our rural areas really expands our market of opportunity. And, um, and so devoting those dollars and then having partners at the federal level, again, and at the um, local level, critically important. We just rolled out the, the first round of our, we took $100 million of that billion and said this is going to go to broadband internet access. Not just awareness, that word has been used two or three times, awareness, access, affordability, all critically important to the consumer. Um, our first round we devoted state dollars of that $100 million, 20, a little over $28 million, but we leveraged that with provider dollars as well. Uh, we just rolled out, that went into 18 different counties in, of our 92. Um, we just rolled out the second round. We'll have more to say about that later, but this will dwarf that 28 million. It'll be probably triple. Uh, we'll be starting to knock on that $100 million investment in a very quick period of time. But to think what we can do when we're all aligned, when all the stars are aligned, um, is just going to be amazing. Um, third, um, not only are we seeking partnerships, and I just alluded to it with local and levels of government and branches of government for that matter, and we're also seeking to, to um, cultivate partnerships with the private sector. Obviously, this is how we get there fast. And that's exactly what we did um, with our program. We built our program um, understanding that the private sector and the government sectors coming together could get us there the quickest. Fourth, um, we focused on the ability to develop and then disseminate accurate data, so data rules, but 
accurate data is what you want to be all, not just transparent about, but all looking at the same data that's um, accurate. And so that comes full circle back to that access, affordability, and awareness when you're making investments. We, we, we're very proud we're a AAA state, but I always talk about that's not just a credit rating. That also has to do with access and affordability and awareness. And then lastly, um, expanding that technological um, infrastructure right now, whether that's um, wired or wireless. I mean, we got to do we got to do both, and we got to do it now. And then we have to have an eye on the future. So we can't be paralyzed by well, what's going to be next? I mean, we got to be acting now, connecting people now. And so that's kind of the again that urgency of now. But um, coming off these last few months has really pushed it pushed it um, forward. So those are the five um, principles that are guiding our not just conversations, but going from the why, the conversational part of it, to the how and the action. Um, Part of it. So I say all that to ask um, Ivanka if we could ask the full board to approve the digital infrastructure principles that we've, that I've just gone over. Thank you. So um, I'm call for a vote. Anyone object? <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Thank you. Approved. Great, great work um, on those principles. And um, I know you've been reaching out to, to all of the members and, and getting real-time updates and, and feedback. Uh, so really just terrific work. And it was very inclusive of everyone's ideas and recommendations. So we appreciate your, your thoroughness in, in this exercise. I'd like to turn it back now to um, Secretary Scalia for a minute to talk about apprenticeships since it's been mentioned numerous times and some of the new programs this administration has initiated to expand the number of apprenticeships that and apprentices that exist in America today. So, uh, Secretary, if you would like to take the floor now, that'd be terrific. Yeah, thank you, Ivanka, and thank you for uh, your support of the w work we do at the Labor Department. Uh, we've obviously had a very challenging uh, few months uh, for the American people, including uh, American workers. As this group knows, in February, we were at 3.5% uh, unemployment, which tied a 50-year low. We'd, had uh, record job creation too, and, and uh, but uh, in the few months since then, we've had many millions of Americans uh, put out of work because of the measures taken to respond to the virus. Um, uh, we are coming out of that. We turned a corner in May. Uh, Secretary Ross touched on it a little bit. Uh, as many of you know, uh, we we learned that in May uh, we added two and a half million jobs back to the economy. Predictions had been that we would lose seven and a half. We added two and a half. And that was just through mid-May when reopening was really just beginning. We know we've added many, many more jobs since then. We'll put out our uh, next job report uh, at the end of next week. But we've, uh, we've made progress. Uh, we'll continue to do that as long as we continue to reopen safely. Um, but we also are mindful that there are going to be uh, more workers, too, who need to be retrained, develop new skills to go into new jobs as our economy continues to move and as we uh, come out of this uh, challenge that we've had. Uh, fortunately, from the very early days of uh, the President's administration, there has been great focus on workforce development and training. That's been reflected in the Council on the American Worker, uh, on the, uh, the advisory board, such a distinguished group of people uh, that's uh, participated in this effort. And also, early on, there was a, a task force on apprenticeship expansion, uh, which the President created by executive order. And uh, that group recommended, quote, a streamlined, industry-led and employer-driven apprenticeship program that develops and recognizes high-quality, competency-based apprenticeships. And quote, that was their recommendation. And I'm pleased to say that that is something that uh, we've now put in place through a rule that we adopted in uh, early March uh, concerning uh, what we call industry-recognized apprenticeship programs. And the concept here is, is sort of threefold. First, uh, and this is something that became so evident to all of us, particularly in the last few years, uh, businesses are so effective in helping with training because they understand where the needs are and where they will be. Second, apprenticeships particularly are an especially good model for driving that because where there's an apprenticeship, uh, there's a job and there's an expectation of a future job, which is one of the reasons uh, apprenticeships are so valuable. We also recognize, third, that the registered apprenticeship program has many strengths, 
uh, but uh, it's not always suited to expansion into industries where apprenticeships have been less established, but where we're seeing a lot of job growth, like healthcare, like cybersecurity, uh, like advanced manufacturing. And so the concept of this rule, the IRAP rule, which we adopted in March, was to promote those apprenticeships. And at the, at the center of it is what we call these standards recognition entities. They're really accrediting bodies. Uh, we recognize the SRE. The SRE, in turn, can recognize specific companies' uh, apprenticeship programs and confer recognition on them, that this is a good, respected, recognized apprenticeship program uh, that uh, is training good workers for that company, uh, but for others as well. Uh, so we've uh, uh, begun receiving applications to become SREs. This can be uh, community colleges. Uh, it can be trade associations. It can be leading businesses, say, in the aerospace or computer technology area, um, uh, who uh, then, and I've seen it myself, companies helping other companies develop uh, apprenticeship programs. They can do that as an SRE uh, and in that way promote apprenticeships uh, throughout our economy. So um, we have material on how to become an SRE on our website. It's, I think, www.apprenticeship.gov backslash uh, IRAP, I believe. Um, and, of course, we're available. We really welcome the support of this group and other companies and trade associations, labor unions, community colleges, promoting this alternative apprenticeship model, which we think will go so far in recognizing programs that already exist and uh, as well in encouraging more. Um, you know, just to wrap up, uh, there were so many great ideas being incubated over the last three years through groups like this, and we've now been presented uh, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to put them to work. Um, so I thank all of you for the extraordinary work you've done over these last couple of years and really welcome your support and look forward to our collaboration going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary. And, and this really builds upon the feedback we heard from people across the country about wanting portable, stackable credentials that match the in-demand jobs. And hopefully we can start to really build out ecosystems of apprenticeships in industries where they didn't exist prior. So, so thank you for your passion for this and, and your leadership on it. And with that, I'd like to turn to Scott Sanders, the Executive Director of the National Association of State Workforce Agencies, who's been leading our Modernizing Candidate Recruitment Working Group. So Scott, <laughs> if, you'd like to, if you'd like to take it away and share with us what, what your group has has been working. And after we go through all the different um, groups, I'd love to open it up um, to, to questions and comments and, and get feedback from, from everyone at the table. Great. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Ivanka. Good afternoon. And thank you, Secretary Ross and Advisor Trump, uh, for your leadership. On behalf of our co-chairs, uh, Johnny Taylor with SHRM and Al Kelly with Visa, I'm happy to provide an update on the ongoing efforts of our working group. Uh, prior to the pandemic, this working group had prepared a report that would help employers tackle the skills gap by modernizing how they recruit, select, and train talent to fill critical skills gaps within their, within their own workforces. Today, I'm going to provide an update of that report, and in tab six of your board book, you can follow along. It's a nice, nice report. Um, with the understanding that this is an evolving document that will be refined to be as effective and possible at proactively addressing the short and long-term needs of businesses during the post-pandemic recovery. The current iteration of leading practices in modernizing candidate recruitment, hiring, and training, it includes a collection of best practices featuring a series of illustrative cases uh, from industry leaders, organizations, and HR experts who have utilized modern practices to attract, hire, and train their workforces. Some practices employers are adopting, including developing and providing customized training opportunities for employees so they can maximize the time and effort spent learning and training to gain skills that are most applicable to them. Personalized training formats such as in-house training, credentialing, degree programs, and job rotation offers employees the flexibility to learn when and how it is most suitable for them. Companies are utilizing metrics in order to evaluate the effectiveness of any organizational intervention for recruitment, hiring, and training. By leveraging data and analytics, companies can produce concrete evidence 
on return on investment as well as identify areas for improvement. Companies and education providers are partnering together to communicate and share information on the desired competencies and qualifications needed for students, candidates, and employees to stay current and inform people in relevant and applied methods that best prepare Americans for future job, job opportunities. Each of these practices provide concrete and replicable examples of initiatives that organizations are using to maximize talent and meet their skill needs. Practices were derived from board members like Visa, who promote employment of untapped talent, the U.S. Chamber, who encourage skills identification, and J.P. Morgan Chase, who hire the formerly incarcerated. The goal of this report is to identify and promote those best practices for expanding and making employment opportunities more equitable through the recruitment and hiring process. In addition, we view this report as a resource to help expedite America's economic recovery post-pandemic by encouraging innovative practices in the recruitment, selection, and training of talent. In response to the advisory's board call to action in May, we updated the report's language to better contextualize the information in light of the current pandemic and included a new case studies that reflect the business realities of operating in a COVID-19 economy. The report acknowledges that the COVID-19 pandemic will continue to have devastating impacts on the U.S. economy, businesses, and employees, but then shifts to highlight the amazing resiliency and flexibility that businesses and employees have shown in adapting their recruitment and selection, management, and training investments. To illustrate this flexibility, we ask board members to share examples with their companies and how they've adopted these in the areas of hiring, training, and recruitment. Many of those examples are in the report. Finally, the report underscores the urgent need to optimize America's talent pool by engaging all potential workers, protect, particularly underutilized or untapped talent. We recognize that during the post-pandemic recovery, although employers may potentially have more choices with fewer open roles, the skills gap is still present and growing. The structural forces impacting our workforce cannot be solved overnight, but employers can lead the long-term recovery with real investments in these processes. We have also discussed collecting additional effective practices focused on the return to work in order to keep the information fresh, and we welcome your continued input. The second item I would like to discuss is a request that we made to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The working group spent the first half of the year producing a set of recommendations focused on identifying people who are out of the workforce and how to link them with employment opportunities in their region of the country. In September, we invited Commissioner Beach and his staff to discuss the current capabilities and scope of data, data available through the department's Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey, or JOLTS. After hearing their presentation, the group specifically recommended more granular JOLTS data, incorporating state and local data elements. This month, Commissioner Beach delivered on that recommendation early, yes, early, and it is here today to discuss that new data on job vacancies in all 50 states and in 18 metropolitan areas. I want to thank the Bureau for all their efforts on this important data analysis and encourage the advisory board to continue our advocacy to make this data available on a regular and ongoing basis. He is here to offer an overview of the data. I now yield my time to Commissioner Beach. Thank, thanks very much, Scott, and Secretary Ross, and Advisor Trump. I have spoken to my staff about delivering early, and I've told them to do it every time, all right? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so uh, at tab two, uh, you will find your slides, and on page 17, you'll find some information on our wonderful MSA JOLTS data. So I'm just going to highlight a few things. You can look at the data yourself. I look at the data, and I just see, I just see real potential here. Thank you very much. Uh, board for uh, for asking us to do this pro project. We, we, we would have probably gotten to it at some point, but we wanted to do it and we have wanted to do it all along. After all, the U.S. economy is really not a national thing, is it? It's, it's a collection of small economies. And so looking at the metropolitan area is makes perfectly good sense. 
And if you're going to try to put people into jobs, you're going to want to have labor demand. And our product is the only product out there that does labor demand. And not, right now, we only do it at the national level, not anymore. On June 16th, we announced these data. These are official data. These are demonstration data. They're experimental data until we get a regular process put in place, which requires a little bit of additional funding. We estimated job openings, uh, hiring, and separations. Those are all elements of what are called dynamic market analysis for 18 metropolitan statistical areas, the largest 18 in the United States. You can see that on the screen now. It, it is the next slide, slide 18. And these 18 MSAs contain 38 percent of all workers in our labor force. So I think they, they, they really do indicate something. Now, when I look at these data, I see uh, amazing variation between just, we just picked four, and if you look at slide 19, I've been looking at data for a long time. Maybe that's what's wrong with me. Um, and uh, when I looked at these data, and these data are just the big, the biggest MSAs in the census regions, the big four census regions, just look at the variation in that data. Now, when you see variation, you ought to be asking yourself the question, why? Why is there variation? If you look at the next slide, on page 20, you'll see that variation occurs during the height of the expansion. Well, this is where I think these data are really going to prove out. Asking yourself, why, are, why, is, this, why is this variation? Well, of course, the first thing, every MSA probably has a slightly different economic base. The economic base of New York is different than that of Louisville, which is different than that of Minneapolis and Los Angeles. So, which part of the economy is recovering fastest? That's the question we would ask right now. Or which part of the economy is growing and why? Why is it growing? Are we making the investments correctly? Are we doing the right things on foreign trade? Another thing, I think regulation plays an enormous role in how quickly labor markets expand. And I think, talking to my friends over at HUD just last week about these data, they said, oh my gosh, this could let us this could lead us to, to look at uh, zoning, land use reg reg regulations. Well, some of you are interested in another regulation, which is occupational licensing. Certain areas do more occupational licensing than others. Could that be the reason why there's these variations? Is it an income distributional thing? Is it transportation infrastructure? Now, for the first time ever, you'll be able to connect those kinds of data, occupational data, zoning data, health data, to labor demand data, which we've not been able to do before. And I think that, uh, Ad Advisor Trump, I think that, that connecting these then to skills data uh, will, will just really produce an entirely new package. So we're very excited. Thank you to the President for recommending a significant amount of funding for this project in the FY21 budget. Uh, we, with that funding, we will double the staff uh, currently, there are 26 noble souls working in Atlanta collecting all of these data. Uh, we will double the staff. We will more than double the sample. And we'll be able to do not 18 MSAs on a quarterly basis, but uh, 50 MSAs on a quarterly basis. And I, and I think that uh, uh, we will be able to see how labor demand is changing across this complex economy. And thus, as a consequence, and I'll conclude here, better shape our educational policy, our investment policy, our infrastructure policy. This should be a, a, a major new element in state economic planning, uh, economic development planning. I think the mayors will begin to say uh, for the first time, oh, yes, there is something up there in Washington that we really like, and it's the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And um, it's really rather exciting. And I think many of us, except for our governors around this table, were incredibly surprised that this data did not already exist. I certainly was three years ago. So it is really exciting that now employers, educators, policymakers, students will have that kind of transparency. And 
per the budget, we will work hard to get the funding to make it per permanent. So thank you for your hard work and thank your team for delivering ahead of schedule. Um, now I'll turn us back. Yeah, please. Um, I believe you have an announcement from the administration and I don't know if you want to touch on that now or, or later. So. Sure. I appreciate it. And so now maybe uh, Ginny, we'll, we'll start with, with Russ and then we'll come back to you for um, a no few more presenters. But uh, while we're on this topic, I think it's uh, relevant to talk um, briefly prior to the signing about the executive order um, that is being put forth today and signed by the president that's responsive to um, the work being done by this council, the recommendations of the council, and also what's happening in, in the private sector across the country, and we're trying to catalyze more of it, leading by example. So Director Russ Voigt of the Office of Management and Budget has been the champion of, of this initiative, and um, certainly as the country's largest employer, it is, it's no small feat, but um, Russ, if you want to just take it from here and tell us a little bit about the executive order and, uh, and what the president will be signing. Sure. Thank you, Ivanka. And I think the president's going to be taking a major step forward at the end of this meeting in ending the bias against skills-based hiring in the federal government as the largest employer uh, and to really use the federal government to champion a lot of the ideas that you all have been putting forward. So what the EO will do is primarily three things. It will end the mandatory educational requirement for hiring unless, as the statute requ requires, uh, that, requ that degree is absolutely necessary to perform that position's duties. It will also uh, no longer uh, require two or four year degrees to be a, a qualifying certification to do a job. And it will also end uh, the ability for candidates to self uh, certify as they go through the process. And this is important, I think, on two fronts. One, on for the benefit of the, the future employee, they have a new pathway that will potentially have uh, meet their uh, degree requirements and uh, apprenticeships and other, other ways to, to uh, access meaningful work and, and experience the dignity of working for the federal government and serving their country. So that's really important as well. We also think it will have a great benefit for federal agencies. About 40 percent of the time, uh, the HR departments will give a list of certified candidates for people to hire from, and the hirers will then go through and they will find that they're not actually qualified for the job. Or worse, they'll go forward and they'll hire, and that person will not be able to do the job that they've been asked to perform. And so we believe that this will actually lead to uh, a, a, a better workforce that's, that is more geared towards being able to accomplish the skill sets that are required and will be able to do it quicker. Uh, we have a number of pilot programs in place right now where we're finding that it will only take six weeks to get through the process. So uh, we're re really excited about this EO. It's a long time coming. The president has been leading on this. Ivanka has been leading on this. Uh, there's been another number of members of Congress like Marco Rubio who have been putting forth ideas like this. Uh, and so we're really excited that the President's taking the step today to have the federal government lead uh, in this area and hopefully it has ripple effects throughout the country. So thank you, Ivanka, for the opportunity to speak about it. It is very exciting and, and we look forward to its swift full implementation. And now I'd like to go back to Ms. Rometty and, uh, to share with us um, some of the additional work that you've been doing on the multiple pathways that I moved too quickly by. So, yes. no, so I, I, apologies. Uh, no, no, we, we didn't want to miss an important uh, component of the supply chain of creating the skills that we're speaking about here, in particular it's the educational institutions. And so if we could hear comments from both the work that's been done from Jay Box and as well from Sebastian Thune. And uh, Jay, who is uh, president of Kentucky Community and Technical System, and then Sebastian, uh, founder, president of uh, Udacity. So where is Sebastian? He's here somewhere. Where did, where did, yeah, right there. Okay, so we'll start with Jay. And so we just don't want to leave out the education system in our comments, and they've done a lot of work in our work stream. So uh, what we've been talking about a lot around this table is the importance of public and private partnerships in an education that, that is just critical for us to reach out to business and industry and have them drive what we do in education. Four years ago in Kentucky, Kentucky Community and Tenant College System partnered with the Kentucky Chamber to bring together the Business Education Roundtable to do just that, to identify the skill sets that were necessary for, the, for our future workers 
and then we went back in education to revise our academic plans to meet those skill sets. Now, that has morphed during this pandemic to now what we call Restart Kentucky, where the chamber and us are partnering together. The chamber is bringing in from the companies all the job openings that are out there, with, like we're talking about the labor statistics. Companies can post what the jobs are that are open at their companies. Then we match up with that with the skill sets that are necessary to fill those jobs and have a link for the individuals to come to us to get those skill sets. And we feel like that's uh, an important part of what we do in education is partner and align our skill sets that we teach with the, with the demand of business and industry. Yeah, I want to I want to thank you for uh, being here, Ivanka, for your incredible vision, uh, doing this in an incredibly timely way, Secretary Ross. Um, obviously, um, the pandemic crisis has accelerated an already existing trend towards digitization and restructuring of society. Um, we have addressed this through non-traditional training opportunities, where we team with companies like Google and Facebook and IBM and, and, and Microsoft and many others to provide technical training to individuals um, that would like to step into the digital world and get a type of the jobs that we talked about before, um, the, the next corner office or the next desk office, uh, as we saw. Uh, in doing so, um, because we're going to talk later, I think Mike talks about this later, about uh, potential new ways of, of providing students with support. We saw most of the support not from government but from industry, from partner companies. We just launched a major initiative at Microsoft really go and you know, offer individuals the chance uh, on the table through some skill-based training. And that's been taking off. Um, from a corporate perspective, the last three months have been uh, sad to say and, and happy to say great business for us because there is an incredible number of people now that, that see the opportunity to move their own careers forward. I really want to commend Ivanka for the, for the vision behind this. Um, I believe at some point in the future it ought to be the case that the American workforce engages in lifelong education, and that's not the case today, at least not the way you want it to be. It ought to be the case that people own their credentials and take them with them. It ought to be the case that this education be diverse and job relevant and skills relevant, not just traditional degrees. And I think this body of people here um, has pushed this harder than ever before. I hope that the coronavirus situation, as sad as it is, provides an accelerant for these developments, because if we do a job really well, we might leapfrog and make this country much stronger. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sebastian. And it was really a pleasure for us to be able to hear from some of your students um, and your Scott as well recently as we um, did a Zoom call as a board and, and really heard their experience of digital online learning firsthand. So, so, so thank you for that. The last working group we have um, will be presented by Mike Piawar of the Milken Institute. And we sought to measure and encourage employer-led training investments. This is really critically important because the employers are closest to the jobs. They know the skills that um, they are seeking to recruit and they really need to take a lead on this front, but there was no commonality towards measuring the effectiveness of these programs, common language, common even, even systems and set of metrics. So yeah. we sought to change that, and yes. um, Mike, you have a great update for us, so, so please, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Ivanka, and, and Secretary Ross, and welcome uh, to the council members. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging Barbara Humpton, my co-chair, who's uh, unable to attend uh, today. She's been a key part of the work uh, that we're presenting today. And Ivanka, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's more critical uh, time than ever. Uh, we've been spending a lot of our time, one of our goals is to prioritize, as you mentioned, the collection of uh, national data on employer-provided skill-based training. And uh, we think it's important for a number of reasons. It's, you know, training is a strategic decision for firms and a, a competitive advantage. Um, but yet there was no, 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 no common language, no common definition of uh, what skill-based training meant. And so as you may recall at our September 2019 board meeting, we presented a recommendation for the specific data categories that should be prioritized in national data collection efforts. 
And at that meeting, we said that if the full board adopted our working group's recommendation for what data should be collected, which we did, we were glad to say, that we'd continue uh, to explore how that data uh, should be collected. And so today, we're pleased to present a report and a set of four recommendations on that exact topic. Before I turn it over to Mary Ann Wanamaker to uh, summary, summarize the report that she led and present our recommendations, I want to give a few shout outs uh, to some folks for their incredible work on this effort. First of all, to Johnny Taylor and his, uh, his team at the Society for Human Resource Management, uh, my co-chair Barbara Humpton and her team at Siemens, and last but certainly not least, Mary Ann Wanamaker, who I mentioned led this effort uh, as, long, uh, as well as her colleagues at the University of Tennessee. So with that, Mary Ann, I'll turn it over to you to to talk about the report and the recommendations. Thank you, Mike, and Secretary Ross and Advisor Trump. Um, so this has really been a great partnership, and we're delighted to release the white paper today following months of discussion. Uh, the truth is we were ready to release it in March, so it's really been burning a hole in my pocket for three months. Um, and the underlying issue we've been grappling with is that, as Mike mentioned, despite a real growing acknowledgement that skills-based training at all ages, as Sebastian mentioned, is going to be a critical component of meeting workforce needs in the future, the federal government's infrastructure for measuring these investments is really inadequate. When I was at CEA a few years ago, I was surprised to find that some of our current estimates of employer training, employer provided training in this country are extrapolated from surveys that were taken in the 1990s. That's how bad the data are. So from a public policy perspective, this is going to be increasingly costly. You can't make good public policy if you don't understand or know what training is being accomplished outside of traditional degree and certificate programs. And I think coronavirus, the COVID-19 has really shown us just how valuable high quality data are for federal policy making. So as Mike mentioned at the last meeting, which was in uh, December, we, um, we did go ahead and approve uh, some definitions on what skilled-based training was, and we set forward these essential data elements and approved these data elements as things we wanted to collect in the effort. And so today, um, I'm setting, we're setting forward some additional, um, some additional guidelines for this collection effort. So in your slide on page um, 23 of your packet, we are expanding on kind of the vision that, that we had before. So before we were telling you these are the essential data items. And then in the, in the white paper, we're going to expand on that vision and also say, in addition to the kind of key things we want to measure, here are the principles by which we want to measure them. Um, and so first we want to emphasize that these data are going to be far more informative if we're collecting them alongside information on firm investments in technology, and in particular, potentially labor-saving technology. So whatever the future of work might be, I think we can all agree that a key public policy question is how workers, technology, and skill-based training are interacting together in the labor market. So key principle one is that the key data elements need to be captured in a way that they can be matched to measures of firm technology investments, for example, robotics and artificial intelligence. That, that requirement or, or recommendation narrows substantially the current federal survey vehicles that could be expanded to meet our needs. We also are recommending that these data be measured every two years so that we're working from frequent up-to-date information on employer and employee behavior. The data should be captured in a nationally representative sample, maybe that goes without saying. And then finally, these data need to be disseminated in the most usable way possible. So we're recommending that the survey be large enough so that tabulations by industry, worker education, geography, firm size, et cetera, can be performed without loss of privacy. Um, and then that leads us to the last slide here, the, rec the actual recommendations for what, we are, you know, what we're asking the statistical agencies to do. And, and to be clear, they have, they have supported us and been involved in this conversation from the very beginning. We're not, telling, you know, we're not suggesting anything that, um, that, that can't be accomplished or that they don't agree with. Um, so here, here are the recommendations. So first, we're proposing two quick adaptations to existing surveys to capture some, key, some of these key data elements even though these strategies won't give us the full picture of employer-provided training that we need, but they will give us some preliminary data to work with. So our first short-run recommendation is for the Census Bureau to expand one of two current surveys to ask employer, employers about their training efforts. This is gonna give us just a quick measure of prevalence and a measure of the dollar investments that are going into those efforts. The second short-run recommendation gives us a quick measure on the employee side. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics runs the National Compensation Survey. 
That's our main tool for understanding what share of employees have access to health insurance, sick leave, paid family leave, et cetera. And so we're asking that employer-provided training be one of the benefits that's measured in that survey. Those numbers are already frequently used to guide policymaking. Um, although these short-run strategies will push us well ahead of where we are today, they're still very imperfect ways of informing workforce policy because we cannot connect employees to employers in any of those strategies. And we're limited in the sorts of questions we can ask in both of the surveys. So in the long run, uh, we're recommending that the statistical agencies implement a new training module. And so that's long run recommendation number one. The module would be a paired employee-employer survey. On the employer side, the survey would take a current survey from Census that's already asking the key questions around technology investments in robotics and AI, and then add a second module that asks about these skill-based training investments. Then the survey instrument would also survey employees at that employer, measuring all of the demographic characteristics that we think are so critical to understanding incidents of training across the population. And then finally, long run recomm recommendation two, and this is the one I'm really excited about because I really think it breaks new ground. Um, we are laying out a vision for how the data produced by this survey will fit into the overall federal data infrastructure. And so the, the magic in that is that this, the strategy we're laying out will allow the federal system to follow trained workers throughout their careers, no matter where they ultimately are employed. We, so we survey you once and we capture you, and then no matter who your ultimate employer is, we'll be able to see how these training investments are paying off. So I am happy to take any questions, but before I do, let me also say that we are looking for partners um, in this mission. So the Census Bureau has successfully implemented a partnership model in the past where Bureau partners, the Bureau partners with nonprofits and outside academics to both design the survey and then to amplify the results. And we think the survey that we're proposing is going to be more effective under such a partnership. So we've had some initial conversations, really exciting conversations with nonprofits who are interested in influence and influencing the work we're doing and amplifying it once it's done but we're anxious to pick up more. So I encourage any interested parties to reach out to me or to one of the statistical agencies, Bureau of Labor Statistics or the Census Bureau. Thank you, I'll hand it back to you, Mike. Thanks, Marianne. Are there, are there any questions for, for Marianne or, or comments before we do this? Uh, Commissioner Beach, if we, if we uh, approve this recommendation, uh, we look forward to your early delivery on, uh, on the recommendations on this. So. Uh, we'll have it next week. Yeah, <laughs> good. We, we used to collect these data back, back a long time ago, and uh, they were, you know, it's always a matter of keeping certain surveys going and not others, which I think is an object lesson for anyone who's doing planning, is to make sure that your long-run vision out is, is much, much more robust than your short-term vision. Uh, it, is, it was too bad that we had to cancel that, that series for funding reasons. Good. Um, and the, the full report is in tab eight uh, in your book if you want to see it. Um, as I mentioned, Marianne led the efforts on that. It's a very thorough report and then very thoughtful, very targeted, very specific, very needed recommendations. And you can just tell from the excitement in her voice about what she's going to do when she gets this data and be able to, to help, uh, help look through this. Um, and uh, so before we, before we take a vote on these, we have three more recommendations from the group. So we should kind of go on with those. So let's, let's go to those. So uh, included in uh, last month's call to action, uh, is the goal to remove obstacles to the modernization of American education and training to accel accelerate reskilling and facilitate innovation in the workforce development. Since then, our working group has been focused on deliberating further on how to remove barriers and create new pathways to workforce development. As a group, we've reached uh, an immediate consensus in three areas, and we continue to discuss in some other areas, to guide public and private sector efforts in creating successful lifelong learning opportunities, and we're pleased to present uh, three of them today. Uh, the first recommendation is to modernize the federal student aid, uh, student financial aid system. Uh, as a group, we are recommending that the federal government allow federal Title IV and other student financial aid for high quality, short term, market aligned credential programs that stack into lifelong opportunities. So, for example, things that Sebastian and, and his great company are are doing uh, for, for workers. Uh, this would give academic ins and institutions and employers greater flexibility to innovate, experiment, and, and, and ultimately improve education and training delivery models 
alongside the traditional educational models. The second recommendation is to expand employer provided education assistance to support employees. As many of you know, many American employees receive some sort of tuition benefits from their employers as support for workforce development. Uh, currently, Internal Revenue Code Section 127 allows for $5,250 of educational assistance to an employee to be excluded from an employee's gross income. As a group, uh, we're recommending that both the size of the cap and the scope of the benefits should be adjusted to ensure that all Americans can benefit from employers' tax advantage tuition investments. And specifically, uh, we came to consensus in three areas. First, uh, we believe Congress should consider increasing the, the, the increases uh, to the cap, uh, which uh, has not been increased in over 40 years, in line with necessary education and training expenditures. Uh, we also believe that expanding Section 127 to include student loan repayment and modern educational purchases such as laptops and other devices um, as types of employee benefits um, should also be considered. And finally, the scope of the benefits should be modernized to give greater flexibility to employ employees pursuing lifelong lear learning opportunities outside the traditional educational model. And our third and final recommendation is to encourage the repatriation of strategic supply chains in specifically in underserved communities. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed that the United States needs to rethink supply chains in such as, for example, medical supplies to make them more resilient to future shocks. As a group, we, mu we believe we must enable a domestic value chain that promotes job growth and workforce development in key manufacturing sectors for underserved communities. Repatriating strategic supply chains in geographic areas where the prospects for optimizing employment for untapped labor pools is, a, is high is a huge win-win for the American uh, public. Now, building on the great work of the Modernizing Candidate Recruitment and, and Training Practices Group, which previously showed us that we should focus uh, our efforts on Opportunity Zones, which you may recall is a federal tax incentive program in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017 designed to spur economic development in distressed communities across the countries is a way to quickly identify geographic areas where the prospects for optimizing employment for untapped labor pools is high. And just a quick aside, I should also mention that one of the recommendations from their working group that we adopted uh, at, at one of our uh, previous board meetings is to create an Opportunity Zone Workforce Development Playbook I'm pleased to announce that two days ago, my colleagues at the Milken Institute uh, re released a report, uh, a 45-page guide or playbook for state and local government officials to learn more about best practices for engaging Opportunity Zone capital and engaging uh, in high in innovative public-private partnerships as part of their integrated strategies for creating jobs and other community-led efforts. We specifically incorporated the workforce development recommendation uh, from that working group into our playbook. It's available on our website, and I'm happy to give copies uh, to folks after the meeting. Um, with that, um, let me open it up. Let me turn it back to you, Ivanka, for, uh, and Secretary Ross for any comments or questions from the group, and then we can uh, call all seven recommendations to a vote. Any questions from the group? I just had uh, one question on the third part there as it relates to the supply chain. You mentioned like health supplies. Is it in particular circumstance or is there more details on what a strategic supply chain? Is? No, we, we did not receive, we did not have consensus over particular areas. The, the idea, the genesis from this was coming from the fact was the COVID-19 pandemic and thinking about supply chain PPEs, medical supplies and those types of things. We did not want to get into defining what specific um, of, of strategic that was. I know there's a number of folks that have a different the different views on what is strategic or not. The important part was there, there, there seems to be this, this, this focus among employers to move from supply chains that were focused more on efficiency and optimization, and now the key word is being resilient. And we thought if, if, if companies are going to be doing that anyway, there are easy ways in, um, in the Opportunity Zone legislation to provide additional incentives to have those, those supply chains come back to the areas that need it the most and where workforce, uh, the, em the employees could benefit the most from that. And so that's the, the That's right, Michael part of that. and, and Scott, just to, to further that, we are um, developing and will soon be presenting a U.S. government plan to do exactly that. Um, highlighting the specific industries that are critical from national security perspective and, and obviously from um, an economic and, and health perspective to, to secure our supply chain and, and create the resiliency Michael just mentioned. So, so thank you. Any additional questions on, 
um, this past working group. Great. Well, Marianne and Mike, thank you so much for your great work and, and the whole team behind you um, in this subgroup who just Herculean effort. So we, we are thankful. And with that, let's call a vote on the recommendations that were just presented. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Perfect. So they are passed. So with that, I am going to open it up to, to questions. Then we will officially adjourn and then um, open back up to a more casual conversation where Larry will kick us off with a little bit of an update on, on the status of the economy and answer any questions you have. We'll take a short break for everyone to stretch their legs and then the president will be joining us to sign the executive order in furtherance of these recommendations. So can I open it up, please, Secretary? Thanks, Ivanka. I just wanted to um, add to some of the comments that were made. Uh, Mike, uh, your first two suggestions there are completely in line with uh, what we have been trying to advance uh, and it's uh, it, it's great to hear the recommendations from from the council in that regard and Ginny you mentioned the um, uh, Workforce grant preparate reimagining workforce grant preparation competition Which we just announced last week, and I think this is a, a really unique um, way to further break down silos that have been so strong between education and uh, the workforce in um, very practical ways, really helping to expand apprenticeship and short-term certification. That's, that's going to be the highlight of the application process. Also, um, thinking about some higher ed institutions, uh, again, the change in this, uh, the ultimate change that the pandemic is going to create both for uh, higher ed institutions and for opportunity for work. Um, the notion of using facilities and faculty exp um, you know, experience and expertise to help incubate small businesses. And that is going to be the other focus of this uh, reimagining workforce preparation grant. So thanks for uh, mentioning that and highlighting it. And uh, thank you, Ivanka and Secretary Ross, for your leadership on the council here. The really great recommendations and great work to really support and um, expand pathways for students of all ages. Last meeting, we discussed recommendations for legislation beyond what was mentioned here today, which was supplementary. And, and it's terrific that in addition to the program just mentioned, many of them were being executed um, or have subsequently been executed by the Department of Education in the form of pilot programs. Pell for prisoners, yeah. some of the short-term funding um, right. for uh, shorter-term high-quality programming. So, so thank you for, for your great work on that front. Um, as we seek to to create larger scale to each of these. Thanks. Any other questions from the group before we officially adjourn the meeting? Amazing. Well, thank you, everyone, for your tremendous work. I think for those of you who have sat on these before, um, there has been an expression of surprise by how much <laughs> this group has, has done in terms of tangible deliverables. And part of the reason that the president's also signing an executive order today to extend the lifespan of the board is so we can take some of the ideas that are now being piloted and really scale them um, in a significant way, particularly the, the learning um, and, and career record, um, the interoperable learning record that we are renaming. Um, thank you for that suggestion. I agree with it. Um, and, and really take those pilots and combine them, learn from them, study them, and, and grow it. And also, obviously, given the delay, um, with the COVID epidemic and, and realigning the message of our workforce campaign. We will be launching that in, in the coming weeks as well. So thank everyone in this room for their continued service for um, another year. And we look forward to, to much more great work in, in the future. And with that, I will officially adjourn and um, go get the president who will be joining us while Larry will um, give an update on the economic recovery, share his insight, and answer any questions you have. Take it away. My hint? Good. Okay. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Ivanka. Appreciate it.
Thanks to uh, everybody here, uh, my colleagues and those from the private sector. So a few thoughts. Um, if you hadn't heard, uh, we are rather more in the V-shaped recovery argument. There's a lot of iterations of that. I've heard about V's, L's, U's. I was speaking to a group, I, I don't even remember, some big think tank, uh, and General David Petraeus asked me, what about a, a square root? <laughs> and I had to really think about that. And then I figured it out, right, got it, no. We're gonna be in the V-shaped recovery, uh, the V-shaped camp. Some days, some years we go to summer camp. This year we go to the V-shaped recovery camp. And actually, it's working pretty well in the early goings. Let's assume we started to grow again in April, uh, maybe late April or May, call it May. And now we're through June. And really almost every indicator is showing a V. Whether that continues remains to be seen. Uh, I'm only as good as the numbers, but the fundamentals seem okay. I mean, I go down a laundry list of government and or private sector surveys. Um, restaurants rising rapidly from a low base to be sure, but they are rising. Home builders sharply, uh, home building demand is very high and we've had some great reports on the housing sector in general. Um, on the other hand, uh, truckers, trucking surveys are rising rapidly. Durable goods had a gangbuster report, I think it was yesterday or the day before. Uh, a new uh, hot indicator is the Apple Mobility Index, which gives you a read on traveling, particularly auto traveling. And that index has gone up so much, it's almost to pre-pandemic levels. And uh, as the economy opens or reopens up, people are uh, cooped up now they're getting around. Uh, gasoline demand is high. We've actually had an increase in energy prices not too hot, not too cold, so they're probably in a good zone. Um, maybe another buck or two, you, you can make some money uh, in the energy business again. Um, initial claims, very important weekly uh, claims for new applications and uh, continuing uh, claims for the un unemployment insurance payouts. Uh, the initial claims, the applications are up 12 straight weeks. Um, I saw some financial places saying, well, they should have gone down more, but I, I don't know. They're down substantially. 12 weeks is a good number. The other thing that's very interesting to me on the continuing claims, which means those that are actually receiving uh, unemployment uh, insurance payments, those have dropped from 24.9 million to 19.5 million. So five and a half, 5.4 million dropped. Now, these are very, very high levels. I get that. But we're coming from a rough place and what I call the pandemic contraction. You know, just as an aside, this is not a macroeconomic event so much as it is a natural disaster that wound up squashing the economy. That's an important distinction. When I see references to prior cycles of recessions or worse, uh, I say to myself, this person's really missing the key point. And it's sort of like a bad, bad hurricane or a terrific, uh, ter terrible snowstorm when it hits, it's very bad, and, and don't get me wrong, there's enormous heartbreak and hardship in these numbers, and we're not near full recovery yet. But having noted that, uh, natural disasters pass, and then you resume your activity. Now, there'll be some patchwork necessary, but the fundamental structures, the fundamental architecture of the economy, which was very strong uh, in the past three years and two months before the pandemic, is there and hopefully with policy actions that are pro-growth and providing incentives, you know, we will build upon that. So uh, I, I think these claims numbers, you know, we had a huge jump in retail sales. Today's income report showed a gigantic jump in overall consumer spending. It was up 8% for the month. I believe it's the biggest one in history. Bill Beach could correct me if I'm wrong. 18% rise in retail sales, I thought was the biggest one in history or uh, very near to it. Three million jobs increase in May. So it's a good story so far, you know. This may be a triumph of hope over expectations, I get that, but 
know, deep prayer and meditation plays a large role in my econometric modeling. <laughs> and I am the quintessential optimist. It's in my DNA. Uh, I'm a terrible bear, and I'm a much better bull. But what I see from the numbers, and we've got all these big shots here who have gigantic departments cranking out numbers, uh, my friend Scalia, my friend Wilbur, and others, and Mr. Beach, who runs the BLS, you know, that's what they're showing. If the changes, will change. But so far, so good, and um, it's very, very important to us. Uh, I will reference the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, uh, not always friendly to uh, free market supply side administrations, but they're showing similar numbers, uh, basically a 20 percent growth rate in the second half of the year. Uh, one of Wall Street's leading economists, Ed Hyman, uh, who has millions of followers, He's looking at 20 percent in Q3, 20 percent in Q4. I'll buy into those numbers. That's what our own uh, models show from the Council of Economic Advisors and the NEC. So if I get 2020, the second quarter is going to be terrible contraction, the pandemic contraction, absolutely. Uh, pick a number, any number of decline, and you'll be close. But coming back from that low level, 20 percent, 20 percent, and if we got 5 percent in Q1, 2021, that arithmetic works out, we will have gotten back to the level of GDP at the peak in 2019. So it won't take five or six or seven years. It could be done, frankly, in the next year. All right? That's what the arithmetic uh, shows. Now, we are looking carefully. Uh, the news on COVID-19 in the last four, five, six days is not good. I understand that. Uh, I'll just add some color to that. Uh, Gene and I were at the virus task force meeting this morning, and, you know, there are about, I don't know, eight, ten, maybe a dozen hot spots in big places. And, you know, those are the facts, and we can't uh, sugarcoat that. You've basically got Florida and Texas and California and Arizona. Those are probably the biggest. Uh, you've got others in some smaller metro areas. On the other hand, uh, the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area has recovered beautifully. Some thought that would never happen. Uh, Michigan, you know, these numbers, in terms of cases and fatalities for those states are big negatives. Uh, Michigan is the same way. Minnesota is the same way. So, you know, there's good news here and there's bad news here. Uh, Deborah Burks, who teaches me what little I know about the subject, says it's not a second wave so much as it is a continuation of the first wave, but which the virus moves. And uh, it's kind of moving south and west. And that's what we're seeing. And the others on the task force, the professional health people, uh, Bob Redfield, Tony Fauci, and Deborah, and so forth, and the others, some others, um, you know, they have tools now we didn't have two or three, four months ago. Massive testing. I mean, we're, we're doing about 500,000 tests per day, right? Uh, hospitalization care is much better, and they're adequate hospitals. The equipment, the PPE equipment and so forth, is in much, much better shape, both in terms of the inventory stock as well as the applications. Uh, the diagnostics are better than they were. So I, I believe this is uh, manageable. That's what they're telling us. Uh, I, I sincerely hope they're right. Um, I would just say um, one of the conclusions from the meeting this morning is the necessity to remind people at the federal level and the state level and the mayors and the county level to maintain good practices. You know, let's not forget uh, wearing face covers when necessary and when appropriate is still very important. Uh, I don't want to preach on this, I'm just saying. This is what they report. This is how we will solve those hot spots, just as we solved, you know, the disaster we experienced in March uh, and April. Social distancing is still very important. You know, lots of young people go into bars, hugging, kissing, and dancing, and whatnot. I'm too old to appreciate whatever they do, but it doesn't look that great in terms of a COVID-19. Might be good in other uh, periods, but it doesn't look so good to me right now. Uh, there's plenty of hospital capacity. So, so this is manageable. That's their message to us. But we have to emphasize good practices and guidelines. Uh, last couple of points. I think I'm essentially vamping while the president comes here. 
which I used to do as a broadcaster. Uh, and you can cut me off after an hour and a half. But I'll just give you uh, just a couple of final thoughts. When I caucused with Ivanka a couple of years back when I came on board here and we talked about this, so much of the heart of this project was about reskilling and retraining and I guess re-educating to some extent too. And I still see this in, in, in that uh, context. And I, I was just thinking, I mean, this is just random thoughts. Um, you know, the need, the need for reskilling is, is enormous in the modern age. And, you know, just think about everything is driven now. Literally, everything is driven uh, by computing, computing skills. Um, t uh, teleworking is going to be very important. 5G is coming. Uh, these are themes that are going to be with us, not only because of the progress of technology and how it infiltrates every nook and cranny of the economy, but I will, you know, add an asterisk for the COVID-19, which is going to change some work habits, may change it for the better, as far as you can tell, as far as I know. You know, stuff like, I was just, random lists, this computing revolution, information processing, everything's a semiconductor chip or based on a chip, uh, healthcare, Automobiles, you know, being a factory worker on the assembly line is completely different today than it was 25, 35, 50 years. I mean, completely, totally different, right? You're operating computers and robots. You can do it. It's just a different kind of job. Uh, factories are different. Farming is different. Um, research, analysis, all manner of science is affected uh, by all the modern gains we've had in uh, technology and technology advances, which I continue to believe is the heart of the American economy. Uh, one of my favorite classical economists is Joseph Schumpeter. Uh, he died in the uh, early 1950s, but I commune with him sometimes on the weekends. He was the guy who coined the phrase uh, creative destruction, and that's what we are seeing. By the way, that Schumpeter, com com you know, my spiritual connection is kind of a joke, but some of it's actually true. <laughs> um, you know, Stuff, simple stuff, like stuff that I might not have known very well 10, 15 years ago, you know, using Microsoft Word, yeah, right? Um, uh, all kinds of spreadsheet works. You know, now, th these are skills you can learn. Uh, even old guys like me can learn them. Everybody's got to learn them. And when they learn them, they can do very well. And I want to emphasize one other thing here. Um, Really, the heart of Ivanka's vision for this project was to use the private sector, not the government, to go through this training, re-education, and reskilling. And I just fell in love with the project when I heard that. Because we have all these, whatever we have, over 50 training programs in the government, none of them probably any good. I don't want to beat up on everybody. But I think people in private business, large or small, they know what they need and what they should teach a lot better than folks here in Washington, myself included. And so that's why I've always admired and tried to support Ivanka uh, on this uh, project. And I'll say this too, folks who learn these new skills, right, and change, um, are a lot more confident about the future. This gives them self-knowledge and self-awareness and self-esteem. And that's probably an overlooked factoid here, but it really is. So they can go out into the workplace and seek jobs and go to interviews, having been to trade schools or whatever it is, community colleges and so forth, uh, and know that they have a good shot at it. And know that they have a good shot at the good life because these skills bring what? Higher wages more job opportunities, and people come back into the workforce. Those are the key points I want to make. And um, I think, you know, that works on many levels such that, and I'll finish on, on this point, uh, I regard Ivanka's project as fundamentally a major contribution to the growth objectives and goals of the Trump administration. I mean, we always talk about lower taxes, which worked, we always talk about rolling back excessive and costly regulatory burdens, which has worked. We've always talked about unleashing energy. We've always talked about 
fair and reciprocal trade deals to help our workforce at home and provide more export markets. That's a growth model that worked for three years and two months until the pandemic set in in March. And it worked great with a 3.5% unemployment rate where low-end wage earners did better than high-end wage earners, where minority groups, including African Americans, did better than the top 1%. And those are factoids. Those are, don't blame, but be, blame Beach and uh, Wilbur. He, they all have these economic uh, bureaucracies. God knows what's going on there. But those are the facts. Seriously, it worked. We went into this pandemic with a terrific economy, probably the best in at least a generation. And there's no reason why we came out, can't come out of this in position to repeat those successes. We did it once, it can be done a second time. And I want to put in that cluster of growth policies, Ivanka's reskilling, retraining, and re-educating. That brings the worker closer with better wages and more confidence and more esprit de corps and a whole lot less fear about the future. So I see this as a growth project. I'm honored to be part of it. It's great fun. I think I have to stop now. <laughs> thank you. I'll just say thank you very much.